Good morning. Um, I'm Vicki Walker. I'm the director of the Department of State Lands and the chair of the South Slough Management Commission. You are here today for our 168th meeting, which is awesome. I'm sorry, we're a little bit delayed. It's 10.07. Um, the um, South Slough uh, manager is not available this morning. An emergency has come up. Um, and we had to discuss that emergency. And so uh, Rebecca will be helping run our meeting um, from the manager side. And we don't have a full complement of, um, of commission members either. Um, lots of things going on in summer, I think. But uh, we don't have anything on the agenda that is an action item, so we'll just, um, and he must be wrong, uh, the new guy. Um, so we'll start out with introductions of people who are on the commission, and then we'll move to those who are in the room. Um, I will start with Rebecca, though, to identify herself. Operations manager. Uh, Member of the commission, I'm really sorry I can't be there. I have a really bad cold, and I apologize. Okay, thank you, Laura Beth. Morgan, I'm a commission member from Coos County. And uh, you are brand new to the commission. We really appreciate you being here. John Sweet from uh, the Coos County Commission and represented uh, this seat for a long while, and he has so much going on, and I recommended, well, why don't you appoint Lance? <laughs> so, so Lance, that's how you got here. <laughs> well, you can blame me, um, but I appreciate it. I know that you worked with the South Slough for a long while uh, when Bree was manager, so I appreciate it. Okay. All right, heading down to my left. The public. And I think we have one more commission member online, Cinnamon. Hi, everyone. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I'm the research program manager at Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport. Okay, great. Thank you. And we don't have anyone from NOAA this time, do we? I, I am actually here. This is Chris Wall with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Oh, I thought you weren't going to be here today. You surprised I, me. I'm happy surprise. I can only stay until 1130, but I wanted to join for what I could. Okay, great. Well, given that we don't have a full complement and we don't have action items, it might not take us to 1130. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right. Um, well, I would like to know who all is joining us in the room, uh, which includes members of FOSS, I see, and also some of our great staff here. So I'm going to start to my right, Deborah. Mike Grable from Charleston. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, Paul. You're going. We're hoping you're going to be a member of the commission. Your your membership just hasn't been certified yet. So thank you for coming. And we open the door for each other this morning. And in the front. Oh, great! Thank you, Kathy. And she does excellent minutes. All right, in the back. Chair Walker. Um, we can't we can't hear anything at all. Could you repeat their name and and association for us? Oh dear. Okay. We'll go back down the line. Deborah. Deborah Rudd, South Slough staff. My name's Mike Graybill. I'm from Charleston. Jeannie Stanley with FOSS. I am Paul Peterson, the superintendent of South Coast Education Service District. Ari Ariano, I am a South SLU intern doing science communication. Kathy Andres is her staff. She's got it. 
Sabre Comet, uh, Coastal Training Program Coordinator at South Sea Reserve. Uh, Fiona Carey, GIS and UAS intern. Haley Thomas, South Slu intern. I'm Laura Breitkreutz. I'm the Davidson Fellow here at South Slu. Awesome. Thank you, Laura Beth, for mentioning that. And, yes, and thank you very much. Yeah, I think I counted three interns. Um, when, if you read your packet, you'll see that we have 12 internships this year, which I don't know if that's a normal size, but it, it's a good number. Higher than normal. Normally we run about eight, so we have a full complement this summer. Yeah, that's awesome. I hope you're enjoying your time here. Um, it, it's been a beautiful summer here on the South Coast. If you're from somewhere besides the coast, it's not always this sunny. <laughs> Um, it's often windy and rainy, um, but those of us that are coasties don't mind that at all. So um, I'm a graduate of Reedsport High School, so I'm a genuine coastie, and it's my 50th class reunion coming up uh, in August. So that's how old I am. <laughs> I'm ancient. Um, okay, well then we will move on to our next item on the agenda. Let's see what we've got. Um, we have minutes. We have minutes from the 167th meeting that Kathy prepared. And if any of you um, would, if I could get someone on the commission to make a motion to approve those minutes, and then, then if there are any corrections, I'll ask that. But let's get a motion on the table first. Plan. A motion oh. to approve the minutes. All right. And second. I second. Was that Laura Beth? All right. Yes. And last uh, last time we met, uh, we elected Laura Beth to be our vice chair. I read through the minutes and uh, remembered that fondly. So thank you. Um, all right. So any discussion about the minutes? Any corrections? Any compliments? Anything you want to say before we take a motion to approve? All right. All those in favor of the minutes as written, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Minutes are approved. Thank you, Kathy. Apologies um, to interrupt, but I forgot to mention that we have one other person on the call, uh, Fiona Nash. Okay. Uh, Fiona, a member of the public? You know? Well, I'm one of Lara's uh, master's advisor, so, and I've been working with South SLU since 2014 on different eelgrass projects, so, you know, just wanting to hear what's going on more generally. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and that's the next thing on our agenda is public input. Uh, Fiona, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, well, not really. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Mike, you're a member of the public. Um, did you have anything you wanted to bring to our attention today? Whoops. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. She's got to give you a microphone. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, I'm just here to uh, get an update on the progress on these different projects and I uh, really appreciated uh, being able to read the minutes uh, and also really appreciated uh, seeing the staff background information that's provided for the commission. Okay, great. Yes, I know. I love reading that. Um, and then, um, Paul, you're you're kind of a member of the public right now. You're not on the commission. Do you want to just say a few words? I don't have any prepared remarks, but uh, okay. uh, I, I think just uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I did submit uh, the application and waiting to hear back. Uh, looking forward to learning more and contributing in any way that I can and helping make connections to the, the education uh, agencies and school districts of the South Coast. We serve about uh, 15,000 students here. Wow, uh, that's that's awesome. And you know we have a lot of education programs for our young people and for teachers. So um, that's a really important seat that you will hold, and I appreciate that. And I used to be, when I was in the Senate, at one time I chaired the Senate Education Committee. And so I'm very familiar with the work of the 
ESDs, and um, they do they do wonderful work for school districts. So thank you. Any other member of the public? I think everyone else is a, a team member here. Woohoo! Okay, <laughs> there you go. Okay, uh, we'll go to the agenda items. And Rebecca, this is really your shtick anyway, the grants update. So why don't you tell us what's happening? It looks like we got quite a few of our requests granted. Yeah, so we've been very, very busy um, this year so far doing grants. Um, I think up until about the first part of March, we had give or take about six to $7 million go in for grant applications. Um, obviously, one of those was our annual operations award. We had um, our construction on our entrance was submitted and some various acquisition type grants. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick rundown on where we're at with those. Um, I'll start with our um, PAC award. So PAC is Procurement Construction and Acquisition. And this is an opportunity that we um, get with NOAA to apply every year for needs we might have as a reserve. And this year we submitted um, after a lot of collaboration and work with FOSS on a design project for our entrance renovation, renovation which is relocating the current entrance to a more safe location a little bit farther north on Seven Devils. It includes um, expanding our parking. It includes getting a hardwired network from Seven Devils down to the visitor center and then some more improvements like security cameras and things like that for our parking areas. And it was trying to remember right off the top of my head, I believe it was 1.6 to 1.7 million dollars. And we did get awarded that um, because NOAA is way, way behind on all of their grant processing this year. It won't kick in until September 1st, but I've already started scheduling meetings for planning with regards to contracting and permitting and things like that. So we will be um, kicking it into high year as of September 1 on that. The county has assured me the first six months automatically will be in the permitting aspect with ODOT and the county. So um, I don't expect boots on the ground or any actual construction type activity to happen until 2025, um, but we will be kicking that off sooner rather than later. Can I um, put you on pause for just yep. a minute? Um, Chris, could you um, share with us what the delay is with NOAA, my my guess is there's so much money, federal money right now, that there's not enough time to process all these grants. You are you are right, and um, so there's an incredibly a large number of grants with the additional money moving through NOAA. In addition, uh, NOAA rolled out a new, or sorry, the Department of Commerce rolled out a new financial system. And then NOAA rolled out a new grant system all at the same time um, as all this new money coming in. And unfortunately, neither of those systems have been working smoothly or well. And everyone, including the grants office, has had to be learning these new systems and, and working out the quirks. So uh, it's uh, the staff are being nice. It's been disastrous. It's been incredibly difficult. Uh, I wish we had any control, um, but this is the reality we're all under, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, when the state rolled out Workday, um, we, had, <laughs> yeah. we had the same issues, um, and there are still issues with Workday, but we're going to get through them, we're going to persevere, and uh, we'll persevere here as well. Well, that, it's nice to know. Um, I just know there's there's a lot of federal money flowing as well, which is great, so hopefully we can get those processed. Um, before all of those things process before the end of the year when the administration may change. Uh, yes, but what, what I can say is the awards were moved over to the NOAA Grants Management Division before the annual deadline. So uh, they, the grants management staff are working as hard as they can to meet exactly all of our end of fiscal year responsibilities and, and, and avoid any other unanticipated impacts. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Rebecca, back to you. Yeah, so um, some of the other grants we've been working on um, are very specific to some of the acquisitions we've been trying to acquire here. Um, 
we've tried multiple times for the Winchester Tributaries Project, which is a project where we're trying to transfer common school lands over to the reserve management. Um, we submitted um, one um, joint application on that um, with, um, I'm sorry, that one wasn't joint. That was through the competitive BIL opportunity this year. We were denied that one. And then we submitted another one in um, coordination and collaboration with DLCD. It was a very large grant that had multiple South Coast projects, as well as one up north in the Tillamook Estuary. We were just notified on Thursday of last week that we did not get that one. And that one was specific for the deal in the Triangle property. The deal is the county property that we've been trying to acquire for some time. Um, we have an agreement with the county um, to um, on that property, as well as an agreement that Part of that transaction will also include a triangle property, and it's a small piece of property just off of Seven Devils, just north of the visitor center here in Salau Lane. Um, it's one of those transactions that will allow us to have Seven Devils as a good portion of our border. So right now, that small little triangular property is 13 acres, Lance. It's only 13 acres. Uh, the county can't do much with it just because of the location and um, what is on the property currently. So that um, process is continuing. We just need to find the funding for it. So one of the other things that we've been in discussion with our NOAA liaison is um, how we can try and make best use of all of this federal money that's out there right now. Um, one of the biggest challenges we always have with acquisition grants is coming up with match. So match for the PAC match for the PAC grant, which is the Procurement Acquisition and Construction Award. That one is just about a one-to-one -one match. And it's really hard for us to come up with that kind of match when we're looking at a million dollar transaction. So with these BIL opportunities out there right now, um, there's no match involved. So we're really, really trying to um, do a big push with that. And our NOAA liaison has agreed that doubling up on our applications for these two big acquisitions will be beneficial. So with that, we um, just submitted a letter of intent. Um, I believe it was on the 17th of July um, for one of those properties. And then we have two more going in. Um, the one in July was going to be for the coastal zone management opportunity for the BIL. Um, we submitted that to DLCD. There's probably going to be a huge amount of interest in that, and they will have to narrow down who they pick to go on for a full bore application. Um, so with that, we're going to submit two more letters of intent um, to the same funding opportunity. We can submit up to three different options. Um, we're going to submit one for the Winchester tributaries as well as for the deal and triangle property. And those go into NOAA on the 15th of August. We're hoping between one of those, maybe two of those, we get our options that we need or the money that we need for these acquisitions. And then we can turn down one if we get doubled up. But um, that was kind of the best strategy with conversations with our NOAA liaisons to try and get get the money for these acquisitions. And uh, let me pause you again. Um, Lance, you're the forester for the county. You've been involved in some of these yep. um, conversations about the Winchester property um, and deal. the deal property, just yeah. the deal property? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And county, we have a, um, I made a presentation to the land board. I think we have a, we do have a letter from the commission, the county commission supporting that. Correct. Okay, so we'll just wait to get the money. 
what we're waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, Rebecca. One of the other things Patricia and I recently did, actually, it was on Monday of this week, we met with Lance as well as um, representatives from Wild Rivers Land Trust, and we did site tours of all of these acquisition properties um, to basically get boots on the ground, have them understand, you know, what we're doing, what we need the property for and whatnot. Wild Rivers Land Trust, we currently have a contract with them for them to help us with the due diligence for all of these acquisitions. Um, and the money that we have to fund that contract is also um, bipartisan Infrastructure Act money. Um, so the BIL money. Um, so we were able to do site visits pretty much to all of the different acquisitions we currently have going on. And um, it, it was a great visit with all of us getting on the same page. What's BIL? BIL is Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. It's a federal law that came out, um, I'm thinking, two or three years ago. Um, it was a big push from the feds to get um, money out and into the economy and to different areas of the federal government. And NOAA, um, our federal partner, um, had a big piece in that. So they've been working on getting that money out to all the reserves and different grant opportunities. Yeah. And then the last um, acquisition that um, we have that it's really not an acquisition, it's more of a land trade. So we've been working with the Lees, which it's the family that owns the property up right beside our entrance. Um, they are, they have Devil's Fork pallets. And as we were moving through our entrance project, um, they approached us and asked if once our entrance is relocated, if there could be a transaction between us and the leads to transfer or do a land trade from our old entrance, and we will get a different piece of the pie, I guess you'd call it a little bit farther down our entrance road that they currently owned so that they can use that old entrance, our old access to um, access part of their land for their business. Um, this was brought to the commission, I believe it was last year we started down this road. Um, when they first approached us, um, the commission has approved land, that land trade. And as of this week, we finally have a signed agreement in place to work towards that. Um, I, I believe signed Vicky it signed it yesterday. I signed it yesterday um, at the summit. <laughs> so the, the Lee property was one we also visited with Wild Rivers Land Trust on Monday, and we had a really good conversation with the Lees um, and discussing where that line's going to be drawn, um, how the surveys are going to be handled, appraisals, things like that. So that is moving forward now that we have the entrance um, grant to do all that work. Um, it, it will definitely happen. We just have to go through the motions. Yeah, and I, I want to thank the commission members, and I, I remember y'all asked a lot of really good questions of the Lees about the property and how it might impact us, and um, it was a really good discussion, and um, I it we have resolved all of our questions, and the Lees are a good family and um, have done everything they need to do to make this happen, mm -hmm. and so I signed the documents yesterday. So it will go to escrow, um, and then I anticipate the escrow documents will require a signature in front of the notary. Um, so yesterday was just me signing the agreement after I reviewed it. Yeah, and one of the big things that this um, transaction will help with, and it was a concern when I met with um, the County Road Department when we were discussing the location of our new entrance, because we did a site visit making sure the sight lines north and south would still be safe enough to be able to relocate the current entrance. And they were very much in support of getting um, the vehicle and truck activity from the pallet company off of Seven Devils um, and then on their own road or on their own property. Currently, when they go to... Um, load semis with pallets they are parked right on the side of seven devils and it blocks the site view going south for anyone pulling out of the reserve so with this land trade it will allow them to have the semis go on their property and get off of the main road so the county was very much in support of that transaction safety wise so so that's a bonus there 
And I've kind of, um, the two agenda items there, the grants update and land acquisition update, I kind of combined them because they're all related to each other. Okay. <laughs> um, the grants were specifically about our land acquisitions and whatnot. So okay. that's kind of where we're at with both of those agenda items. All right. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to impart to the commission? Oh, the one last um, project we've been working on um, grant-wise. Um, so with the Wasson restoration um, kicking off, and actually today is the first day with excavators and everything in place, Perfect. it's a busy time. Um, and then that's why we don't have Alice here for her update. Um, we are working, we received a, a grant from NOAA to return public access to the Wasson Valley after the restoration. So we've been working with a local contractor on planning and whatnot. Um, we're looking at improving some of the current trails that are there, um, looking at um, expanding one trail specifically from like the parking area down to the actual Wasson area. And then we're also looking at um, getting um, plans and um, work done to be able to put in a, a, a boardwalk that will allow people to actually get out in the middle of the valley. Um, it, it's been a process, um, but we're we're working through that. We have about $300,000 to put towards that public access. So um, a lot of that work will be happening during the in-water work period when they're um, doing that work down there starting this week and i understand there's been um tribal engagement yep tribal engagement of what we do here yep. does all along the way the tribes so that's good and they have approved all of our plans up to this point so all right yeah thank you i have to apologize for my voice today the um smoke has activated my asthma um and so i had my inhaler going this morning <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of falling apart uh, with my voice, but we'll keep moving along. Um, any questions from the commission members or uh, let's start with the commission and if anyone in the, in the room has questions regarding the report we just heard. I'll start with Jessica here in the room. With the entrance, as I came in, it looks like that must be the lease property and they're building a big new, looks like a huge foundation. They're actually building store, uh, um, shop type storage buildings so that um, they can protect a lot of their assets over there. And that's kind of one of the reasons why they would like our old entrance in this land trade is so that they can have safer access into that. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, Lance, did you have any questions? Okay. Any commission member on the uh, virtual have any questions of Rebecca? I don't just, have, go ahead. Go, I was just going to say congratulations. I know all of this has been a lot of work, so nicely done. So, Cinnamon, you just took away my comment. Uh, <laughs> I, I, too, it's been a lot of work for them. I know that. Um, I'm very, very appreciative. Great. Um, okay. Any member in the audience have a question of Rebecca before we move on? Okay. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for that report. And there are even more details and more budget information if you want to know budget uh, in the report. So I encourage you to read that if you have not done so already. Uh, we'll move on to the Eelgrass Research Project informational presentation. And I'm really excited about that. Eelgrass was mentioned several times in the report in different areas. Um, the one that I was really interested in, and I'm hoping that we um, get uh, a report on that was the eelgrass pilot transplant at Bellino Island. Um, I, I'd like to, I read the document, but it, it'd be nice to know if that's going to be part of the update. Is that part of your update, my dear? <laughs> Definitely not quite. Okay. But All right. Well, if you will identify this is adjacent. yourself for the record, and uh, maybe we'll get an answer to that, um, and then we'll see what you have today. So uh, identify yourself again, please. My name is Laura Breitkreutz. I am finishing my time up here as the Davidson Fellow. Right. 
Can we move that microphone so, and actually, can you move the podium out and then you don't have to lean over? It should maybe just slide over. Yeah. There. Ooh, there okay. you go. Now there you, we go. you can be, have your posture correct. Amazing. <laughs> As my mother used to say. All right. Well, um, can you all see the presentation on the screen? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, Laura, take it away. Yeah, so as I mentioned, my name is Laura. I'm the outgoing Davidson Fellow. I'm finishing up my time here and um, have been coming down to South Slough over the past two years to conduct some research. And I'm, I've had an incredible experience and I'm really excited to share with you some of our findings today. And so I'll be presenting on the spatiotemporal variability in eelgrass eel sexual reproduction in South Slough and Lower Coos Bay and implications for conservation and restoration efforts. And so I'm going to begin with an introduction. I'm sure many of you are familiar with eelgrass, but I'm hoping that everyone can learn something new today. And then I'll cover my research questions my methods, some results, and then what this means for our beloved South Slough Reserve. So eelgrass is a globally distributed seagrass species, and it's also a defining feature of our estuaries here in Oregon. It's this underwater flowering plant that creates underwater meadows, and in doing so, it provides critical nursery, foraging, and spawning habitat for many organisms. Um, just to name a few, we have the Dungeness crab, Pacific herring, those are herring eggs on uh, eelgrass blades, sunflower sea stars, and our coho salmon in their juvenile stage. And eelgrass habitats are increasingly recognized for their role in sequestering and storing carbon for mitigating the effects of climate change as well. Unfortunately, we have direct and indirect human disturbances that are degrading these and other nearshore ecosystems, as well as uh, uh, the impacts of global climate change. Uh, in fact, we're losing eelgrass globally and also- Excuse me, globally. I can't hear. Oh. Sorry? Did you just suddenly not be able to hear? I can hear fine. Okay. Laura Beth, is it maybe your computer? Can you hear me? I can hear Chris. It seems like it might be her because the rest of us can seem to be able to hear, so. Okay. I can hear it now, thank you. All right, great. Sounds thank good. You. And I was, uh, since we have a, a a short break in the conversation. I'm curious about the word blob. Is that a scientific term? It says yeah. blob forming in September 2014. <laughs> so this specific marine heat wave was named the blob. And <laughs> and we, yes, we use this term um, uh, to describe this marine heat wave that actually reached our Oregon estuaries uh, during the years 2014 through 2016. And what we saw was that eelgrass declined across the region, including here in South Slough Reserve. And this graph actually depicts that decline um, during and after that marine heat wave. And um, we see that one bed, that yellow line is recovering. One bed, the um, orange line is struggling to recover in shoot density and then Two beds, uh, at two beds, eelgrass has not returned. And these are long-term monitoring sites. And so this recent mortality event and others uh, globally really highlight the need for us to understand how seagrasses recover to and respond, uh, recover from and respond to disturbances and also what may be driving these differences in uh, recovery that we see. And the mechanism that I'll be uh, talking with you today about is uh, re reproduction.
Let's see. Is this not? Okay. See, I can just take this and which button do I press? The arrow keys. Okay. Laura, I wouldn't have um, thought of eelgrass having sexual reproduction. It's kind I know. of an interesting term. Yeah, so what, when I say sexual reproduction, I'm uh, talking about flowering and seed production. Okay. And the buttons here, Sabra, are not working for me either. All right. No, it is not. Okay. A few technical difficulties. We landed on a really depressing slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the blob. It's about to get a lot better. Okay. That, you know, I think there was a movie one time called The Blob. Wasn't there from like the 1950s or something? <laughs> oh yeah, it was way scary back then. All right. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, okay. there we go. Okay. Okay. Let's okay. Go. Well, this is now we're going to yes. get really interesting. Yeah. Now let's talk about um, some forms of reproduction. So for seagrasses, reproduction can be asexual or clonal. And so this type of growth is basically um, when those clonal shoots are growing and expanding horizontally from that rhizome, that root structure, at a rate of about um, one shoot per month. And reproduction can also be sexual, and this is through flowering and seed production. And uh, we found that on average here in South Slough, our flowering shoots are developing and producing um, 60 seeds per shoot, which is a lot compared to that one shoot per month. And so... While asexual is that dominant mechanism for bed maintenance in our Oregon eelgrass beds, sexual reproduction really becomes critical to recovery after those large mortality events. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is, but also describe the process of flowering. And for that, I actually have some fun things to pass around. Hmm. Cool. Okay, so flowering is typically this annual occurrence that happens during the warmer months. Only a portion of the shoots in a bed flowers, and then each flowering shoot is composed of these multiple seed-bearing parts that I'm passing around now. Uh-oh. They're called spadices. And the spadices that um, are in that little uh, container are in multiple stages of development, but they contain male and female flowers. And then seeds develop within those spadices and those seeds are released and they sink and settle to form the seed bank, which is uh, defined as that local supply of viable seeds in the sediment. Thank you, Sam. And um, in contrast to asexual growth, seeds actually provide this reservoir of genetic diversity. So they increase the genetic variation in a population, and this actually can enhance that population's um, resilience to disturbance. And I chose uh, a figure from a study where plots uh, of eelgrass with differing amounts of genetic variation were planted and subjected to a disturbance. And this disturbance was actually grazing by geese. So very relevant here. And we see shoot recovery after that disturbance. Um, there's almost twice as much shoot recovery in plots with higher genetic diversity. And so this is one way um, that seeds help a population. Seeds also provide a means of dispersal for population range expansion. And so this is a photo of beach rack from Fossil Point here in Lower Coos Bay that I took yesterday. Um, 
this rack can actually travel many kilometers and flowering shoots can um, are inside that rack. And so they can actually, the rack has the potential to di disperse seeds to new and potentially more suitable locations. It's also important to note that um, investment in sexual reproduction or flowering is influenced by both environmental and genetic factors. And these occur at spatial scales, including across latitudes, within single estuaries, and um, across depth gradients in single meadows. Um, and, and there are still many questions as to how all of these interact to influence uh, the timing of an investment in a population's uh, sexual reproduction. And so now I'm actually going to switch gears to talk about restoration. Uh, there's actually this growing interest in seed-based restoration methods. And while the common method for restoration has so far been using transplanted adult shoots, there's been large scale and lasting seed-based restoration success for eelgrass here in the US. Uh, it's shown that restoration by seed maintains the genetic diversity, and we know that this is, is important for population resilience in a changing world. Should I admit, Jenny? There we go. <laughs> seed <laughs> from fieldwork. <laughs> Um, Seed-based restoration is also being explored in other parts of the world, and people are trying to fill knowledge gaps and innovate methods for large-scale seed-based restoration. There are still challenges, but with those challenges come opportunities for improvement and in more innovation. And as far as the Pacific Northwest, we have a long history of eelgrass uh, restoration, but I would say that Oregon has a need and an opportunity to conduct more of it, and also seed-based methods could play a role. And so that leads me to my research question, really, how do eelgrass sexual reproductive properties and their phenologies, which is just a fancy word for timing, varies across Coos Bay and South Slough? And so characterizing this will provide a baseline understanding for us here of recovery potential from seed and also help us identify potential donor sites for seed-based restoration projects. And donor sites are locations where flowering shoots can actually be collected for seed harvest for these projects. So I will go over my characterization effort of flowering seed bank densities and seed characteristics. And then I will also suggest potential donor sites based on these data and discuss some considerations that South Slough uh, could have in mind. Um, this is so fascinating. Next time I'm out in the estuary and I come near eelgrass, I have a whole new perspective Amazing. about what it is and how it reproduces. I, I'm hoping that um, your uh, these slides here can be put on our website and shared with the commission members. This is this is absolutely fascinating, um, and you deserve a, a lot of credit for the work you've done here as a Davidson Fellow. This is this is amazing. I appreciate that. Thank you. And yes, we can we can share the slides for and sure. Yes. Viability of the seed. The seed viability. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good. Question. That's a great question. Um, seeds are typically viable for about a year, and in, in our germination experience, we see about uh, thirty to forty percent of of seeds that successfully germinate. In water, so these seeds need to stay uh, submerged, yeah, in water. Mm -hmm. And so this map on the left shows our study sites spanning from Valino Island to Clam Island. Valino Island is where Allie Helms led that recovery uh, restoration effort with transplanted shoots from Clam Island. So Clam Island did act as a donor site in the form of a transplanted shoots, not seeds. Uh, Culver Point, was uh, that site 
where in the first graph we saw a lot of recovery after the mortality event. And Fossil Point and Barview are two sites where we know uh, extensive meadows exist. So they have um, high potential for um, donor sites. Yes. Um, that, the graph you had about Culver Point, how come it's how come them are recovering so fast? Do you know? How, how, why, why Culver Point yeah. and not others? Um, we don't know. And that's why <laughs> we're looking at one mechanism of recovery, which is um, flowering and seed production. And I'm sure it has something to do with uh, the environment as well. Yes. I saw that we have some um, of our other staff on the call. Uh, are, are any of them able to answer that question? Yeah, I can chime in. Hi, I'm Allie, the Esther Monitoring Coordinator and help lead the monitoring for the eelgrass. So um, we saw different declines of the different sites occurred um, at different times. So Culver, um, Bellino actually declined first, followed by upper estuary sites. And there's some protection, I think, that's happening there. We didn't see a total loss at Culver or Bellino, just a big drastic decline. Um, the upper estuary sites were absent of eelgrass, and that happened later than the other two sites, about a year later. So the Culver Point site is deeper. Um, it's closer to the mouth of the estuary. It's more saline, whereas Bellino and the upper estuary sites have more variability in their salinity. It's fully tidal, and so the, um, they can get down to like 10 part per thousand. So I think the plants are kind of recovering on the edge, the deeper edges. And so we're seeing that at both Culver and at Bellino, but not rec no recovery is occurring across the inner tidal. And that's probably that more stressful environment that used to be really productive for eelgrass, for intertidal eelgrass. But now with our changing environment, the warmer temperatures, we've seen increased turbidity and sediment in the winter as well. Um, it's just struggling a little bit more to recover um, in those sites, the intertidal if that helps. Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, yeah, and so at each of our study sites, we sampled at two intertidal depths. Um, just as Ali said, we have an upper intertidal and a lower intertidal, and the eelgrass uh, lives across this gradient. So we're going to study um, both of those. And so we set up 100 meter long transects at each tidal height and we record flowering shoot densities. Uh, we also collect those flowering shoots, take them back to the lab and uh, take measurements, including shoot length and the number of spadices per shoot, which are those seed bearing parts that I passed around earlier. So that really uh, controls the amount of seed production per shoot. And then we also pour the sediment and we sieve that sediment and count the seeds and also measure the weight and area of those seeds for some size metrics. This is a very large effort and it requires many, many hands. None of those individuals in the photographs are me. Um, they are just some of the people who have uh, joined to help in this effort. And so just wanted to give them a shout out. So we also do a bunch of statistics that I'm not going to get into, but I'm happy to talk more about. Um, and so, yeah, let's get into the results. So to orient you to this graph, we have the day of the year on the x-axis from zero to 365. And on the y-axis, we have flowering effort, which is basically a ratio of shoots that are flowering to total shoots. So it spans zero to one or 0% 0 to 100% percent shoots that are flowering. And the sites are stacked on top of one another. And I really, um, to highlight the um, where those ver dark vertical lines um, intersect that x-axis. And so that dark vertical line denotes the timing of the peak of flowering effort from our data. And what we see is that the timing of peak flowering effort spans from late spring to late summer. You can't see it up there, but uh, it, it spans a 12 week period across our estuaries, across seven kilometers. And so um, 
between those two peaks, we have the reproductive season and the next series of graphs I'm going to show you are taking averages of values from that reproductive season and we're going to compare those across sites. So to orient you to this uh, graph, we have site on the x-axis and we have our reproductive value of shoot, um, shoot density on the y-axis. And what we see here is that um, we see that eelgrass abundances are greater at those lower tidal heights. Um, and so, sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, the lower tidal heights are the darker um, bars and the upper tidal heights at each site are the lighter colored bars. Uh, we also see that Clam Island is significantly greater in shoot density overall. We also see that eelgrass flowering effort is greater at those low, lower tidal heights. We also see that seed bank densities are threefold greater at those lower tidal heights. And here we also see that Fossil Point overall has significantly lower seed bank densities. And these sets of graphs are a little bit different, but we have upper and lower tidal height on the x-axis. And what I really want you to take away here is that seeds collected at that lower tidal height are larger and heavier. So that tidal gradient is super important. Here, the x-axis, we have site once again, and we see that seeds collected from bar view, that pink site in the middle, are significantly heavier. And what I, um, the pattern is also the same for seed area, though I'm not showing the graph up here. So bar view seeds are significantly heavier and larger than seeds from all other sites. So what are the implications of these findings for South Slough Reserve? Basically, sexual reproduction or flowering and seed production varies not only across sites, but also within sites, within that, across that tidal gradient. And this um, means that natural recovery potential from seed may be greater at those lower tidal heights and also at certain sites, in, um, while natural recovery potential from seed might be lower at other tidal heights. And from these findings, I suggest two potential donor sites for flowering harvesting, uh, for harvesting flowering shoots for seed-based restoration efforts. And those two sites are Clam Island and Barview. And I also suggest that harvesting take place at the lower tidal margins of these beds. Yes. Because you did answer my question that came up when I was reading on page 33 about the pilot transplant project. And um, after they used adult vegetative transplant methods, and after three years, the plots at the lowest elevation transects have higher eelgrass abundance with uh, deep and low elevation plots maintaining planting densities. So it follows with the research that you have just concluded with here that those lower intertidal areas uh, are the best location. Are doing better, yes. Yeah, that's really good news. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'm sure Ali has, can also answer questions about that, that restoration. Yes, I think Lina. that's her project. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so choosing a donor site has many considerations and I'm only going to highlight a few here um, the impact to, to that donor site is important to consider, and this takes into account overall eelgrass abundance. Uh, higher shoot densities could help to minimize the impact of harvesting. And so if we're thinking about our sites here in South Slough, Clam Island with its significantly higher shoot densities could be the better option. Flowering effort of a site also influences the amount of um, shoots that could be harvested. And um, Barview and Clam Island have uh, comparable flowering effort, so they both make good options there. Seed bank density and persistence, we would want to ensure that the sediment seed bank at that donor site 
remains at densities that would provide that natural recovery potential from seed. Seed size is a consideration that um, is important because larger seeds uh, contain higher starch and nutrient contents. And this may mean the seeds are viable for longer, that they germinate from greater burial depths and they produce larger, more robust seedlings. And this has all been shown in other studies. And so if we were to consider seed size, we would probably choose Barview over Clam Island. And I'm sure we could have interns do germination experiments to test all that. We also see that timing is important and very site specific because our models and our observations are suggesting that Clam Island flowering peaks later than Barview. And then lastly, the um, spatial extent of the bed. How much eelgrass are we even working with? And this would influence how much harvesting we would want to do and also over what spatial scales we would want to be collecting those harvesting shoots at or those flowering shoots at. Once again, thinking about minimizing that impact to the donor bed. And shout out to Jen Kirkland here at South Slough for her drone efforts. She's already taken a lot of pretty pictures of the eelgrass beds. And so in the context of increasing global change, it's really important that we understand this variability in sexual reproduction in flowering because um, it's, it's a natural um, mechanism of, of recovery. And yeah, I guess I'd, I, this is a huge effort and I'd like to thank everyone who has, has helped um, over the past two years. And I will be also expanding on these results in my thesis defense uh, next Friday. The Zoom link is on the right over there. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes, you may. I'll open it up to questions. Is, our, is, our, is there any natural predators to these beds? Are birds eating all these seeds or fish? I mean, we plant them all, but if something's eating them. Yeah, the, the seeds, we have actually not done any pilot seed restoration plant uh, experiments here. Um, but Sean Schuler has uh, an intern right now looking at crab predation on seeds. Yeah, the, the green crab specifically. Those darn green crabs are at it again. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions of Laura? Uh, Mike. Mike, and let's identify ourselves for people on the screen. Hi, my name is Mike Graybill. Um, thanks uh, so much for your work. Uh, I'm just, uh, as a, someone who's been involved in this for some time, uh, I can say with certainty that Margaret Davidson would have been very proud of your work. Uh, <laughs> and it would have been really fun to have Margaret in the room because she would certainly have something to offer uh, uh, regarding your work. Uh, regarding seed size, just a comment, some, uh, some of the observations of your, of your, of your work uh, the uh, area at Barview gets the highest wave energy exposure of any of those sites because it's right at the entrance. Uh, and it's not surprising that seed densities and your seed bank would be greater in the lower elevation areas, particularly in those shallow subtidal, because they would be less exposed to the, uh, the hydro hydrodynamic forcing of breaking waves uh, in that lower portion of the bay that would resuspend and carry seeds off. Um, the observation that there is a smaller seed bank in Fossil Point makes sense in my mind because it's a rock substrate uh, and there's not a lot of soil that would be available to, uh, to retain seeds. So larger seeds uh, it, at Barview make sense to me because smaller seeds may be winnowed away by physical forcing factors. So uh, it's really exciting as an observer of trying to create my own mental construct of how eelgrass and seagrasses work uh, in, in this estuary. It's really great to see the information that you've gathered uh, because it really helps me adjust my mental concept of how this system works. So thanks very much. 
Thank you, Mike. Any other questions? I know I have one, but I want to wait. Um, see if anyone else has any questions. Um, my question is will involve Allie if she's still on the line. Um, Allie, you used um, adult vegetative transplants on Valino Island. Can we use seed transplant, um, harvesting seed and then planting seed elsewhere um, with greater success perhaps? Yeah, so right now um, this, obviously all of Lara's work has given us a good idea of do we have enough seeds? So unlike the adults, you know, we transplanted maybe over the whole course of that uh, restoration project, I'd say maybe 300 individuals, you need millions of seeds. Um, there's different methods. You can literally throw them out into the environment, um, but then you wouldn't have a good idea of how well that's working. But that is a broadcast method that a lot of people have used um, in other places in the world, like in Europe, um, there's some Danish estuaries. Um, you can also put seeds, a known number into um, bags, they're called Hessian bags, and then you're able to see how many of those seeds actually turn into seedlings and survive. Um, but I feel like we're still figuring out exactly if we'd be able, so you'd, we'd be harvesting um, clearly from sites that aren't declining, right? So that's a concern where we wouldn't want to harvest um, from these sites in South Slough that maybe are more vulnerable. Um, another thing we did with the education um, group that we're still figuring out methods, but we actually uh, grew for the first time. Um, this is uh, largely due to all of Lara's efforts. We grew seedlings from seed. Um, I think we started with about 500 seeds and we ended up with about 150 little tiny plants that we planted out at Fossil Point as an experiment as and as an education activity. So that's also something to think about is, um, you know, like an aquaculture type scenario um, to be able to just propagate these plants. Um, we do it, you know, in a controlled environment. We did it on the OMB campus. Um, so you can control things that you may not be able to control with when you're harvesting um, the flowering uh, shoots for seeds. But I think we definitely, the next step for us in our research is trialing some of these methods on a small scale. So we don't need to you know, outplant millions because we don't have millions of seeds that we know of at this point, but we can try small experiments where we keep track of a known number of seeds and see if the environment is suitable um, and if the seedlings will grow and survive um, you know, in these lower elevation areas. We, we are working with um, a nurse science collaborative group, um, Connecticut Bay um, Research Reserve, as well as um, Lillian Aoki from the University of Oregon and Torrance Hanley, um, who's actually in um, Massachusetts. So we're looking um, at right now, just because it is not well known um, how seeds do, there's not a lot of people doing um, this type of uh, restoration with the seed. So we are compiling um, all of the information that we know exists, um, mainly from Oregon, if there are examples, but we're looking out because we're not finding a lot of examples. So um, we're broadening that to examples um, in Europe and in Chesapeake Bay, which is um, one of the largest um, successful stories for seed-based restoration that they've done um, in the past. And so we can learn from these methods and trial some experiments and see if it's gonna work and help us increase our populations. Well, uh, I, I appreciate all your, your devoted science work on this. We don't know when the next blob is going to hit us and it already has I it already has so um you know with climate changing almost daily um this planet could use all the help it can get so your your research is valuable and i really want to thank you for sharing it with us today yeah. and there's one more question in the back from sabra I, oh, oh, can i just tack on something to yes, ali's point real quick um I could also see seeds as um, coupled with transplant shoots where we might not have millions of seeds, but because of the benefits of using seeds for increasing population resilience, I could see where we use both uh, approaches, transplant shoots and seeds um, in tandem. Good idea. I'm excited to see what's ahead. Saber comment, uh, South Sea Reserve. So I already know the answer to this. So I'm cheating a little bit, but could you share with us what your next plans are? Yes, I will be. I'll be uh, pursuing a PhD up at University of Washington, 
uh, asking more eelgrass related restoration questions, which is super exciting. Cool. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks. And you won't ever forget the South Slough. <laughs> Never. <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> That's, that's yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and before we go any further, I, I want to acknowledge that our great leader, uh, Patricia Fox, has joined us. Her emergency has been resolved. All is well in the world again. Um, so I, I'm so glad. And um, as you know, Patricia came on, let's see, I saw that somewhere, March, March 4th. March 6th was her mm -hmm. first day as the reserve manager. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna share with you that um, just recently Patricia moved um, to Port Orford. So she's now a South Coastie and that move was anything but easy. Um, so, uh, but her chickens are safe. Her goats have been rehomed um, and uh, they'll, be making their home on the south coast so um patricia you want to say hello sure hello i'm so sorry i was delayed uh arriving here this morning um luckily i i got most of uh, lars amazing presentation so thank you again for that presentation and my sincerest apologies for my tardiness um yeah very happy to be here um in a temporary apartment for now in Coos Bay, but yes, ultimately relocating to Port Orford. I'm very excited to truly be here um, and not making a four and a half hour drive um, on the on the regular almost daily. So I'm <laughs> very excited about being part of this community in the most authentic way by being a resident as well. So thank you. And um, thank you, Rebecca, for covering probably all of the grant updates um, that we are going to go over this morning. Um, Sorry, before we move on, yeah. uh, we do have a question from Laura Beth Barton. Uh, Laura Beth, you have a question. No, I don't have a question. I have a, a big thank you to Laura for that report. Um, very, very instructive, uh, very informative. Um, I know we all knew the importance of eelgrass, but we didn't really understand the whole process. And I kind of feel like I do now, which is really great. Um, one of my sons volunteered out there replanting eelgrass. I didn't understand what he was doing particularly, but um, um, he found it uh, uh, hard work and a lot of fun, great people. And um, so I just wanted to thank her very much for everything. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, did we have anything other um, that mm -hmm. isn't listed here today, Patricia? No, I think we're going to move on to our information reports. Most of our staff, this is one of their busiest times of year, so I'm actually going to be providing most of the program updates with the exception of the coastal training uh, program that Sabra, um, that they can go ahead and provide their own update. Um, did you want to do, Rebecca, the administrative and facilities or... I pretty much updated everyone on the grants okay. and things like that okay. earlier. Um, the one thing that I did want to um, add is we're still um, working through the grant that we received to update the exhibits and our public restrooms, as well as adding ADA automatic doors to our visitor center here. We were able to receive some um, extended time as well as a little bit of more money um, to complete that project. That was a COVID project. We kicked it off um, in 2021. We had a lot of setbacks. We had a lot of price increases, things like that due to everything that was happening in the world. Um, but Noah has been very helpful with that. And um, the restrooms are 100% complete. The exhibits, as you can see, for those of you that are in the room today, um, you walk through our, I'd say, probably 75% of all of our new exhibits. They're very bright. So those of you on the um, Zoom call, if you haven't made it into the visitor center yet, 
please come in and check them out. They're absolutely wonderful. I never realized how faded our old exhibits were until these bright, vibrant exhibits showed up. And it's like, ooh, those were looking pretty bad. But they are awesome. Um, and our last step in that entire grant is to update five access doors into the visitor center with automatic doors. We're under contract and um, the contractor we've been working with, I believe it's Richard's Renovation out of the Salem area. Um, they are in the planning and ordering materials stage um, after our big event in August for the 50th in the land board, they will probably start construction on five doorways, the front entrances, um, one classroom door, as well as access into the auditorium with automatic doors. So that's our big facility thing happening right now. Um, any questions, uh, Rebecca, before we turn it over to Patricia? All right, so that means you're gonna be doing the education, which ones are you doing, education? I'm doing education, science, stewardship. So um, okay. I'll do a brief education, then hand it over to Sabra. Okay. All right. Sounds okay. good. So um, this, as I said, this is the one of the most busiest times for our, our staff folks across the board. Um, for the education staff, they've provided programming for over 2,000 people just during the last four-month period, which amounts to about 5,000 hours of estuary learning. Um, one particular highlight I wanted to showcase was um, Sheree Turner, who joined us in March to help support program delivery. She's our new seasonal education specialist, and the majority of her time has been focused on school field trips, and she's just been a great addition to the education team, supporting our local schools programs and community programs, along with summer camps as well. Another thing um, that was different this year that we tried, um, what our summer camps are always very, very, very popular, and we only have so many spots. So um, something that was new was to create a lottery system so that um, it was a little bit, the idea was to have it a little bit more even across the board. Certain folks would know about summer camps and register you know, right on time, and other folks in the community wouldn't find out until later, and then all the spots were full. So this was a way to um, create a little bit of equality amongst the systems. So it was a big... Um, kickoff to see how it would go. It went really smoothly. 170 kids were signed up and had the chance to obtain, um, oh, 170 kids were signed and had the chance to obtain a, a camp space. 88 spaces were available altogether. We received feedback through the survey system that this was a great way to um, kind of create some equity amongst the systems and that it worked really well. So I think um, the idea is this year was a pilot to see the feedback um, and to if it was successful to maybe pursue that in future years. So it sounds like it, it went pretty well this year. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, um, the education lead, um, Jamie, has been very busy with the new exhibit install. Um, not all of it is um, there, but most of it is. And it's just, yeah, very beautiful, interactive, and we're really proud of it. Ashton, who has been our amazing AmeriCorps um, volunteer, has been with us for 11 months. And just at the very end of this month, so coming around the corner, um, he will leave for a new job at a college in Vermont. So we really appreciate everything he has done. He has been engaging with all of our interns um, at Spruce Ranch regularly. He's just been amazing through his Estuary Explorers Program, Environmental Education camps, school field trips, and community outreach efforts, he, his service delivery number is 542 people served during the last 11 months. He's just been a great addition. And on that note, um, Jamie and Deborah are in hot pursuit of our, of a new AmeriCorps volunteer. So I believe Deb was doing interviews, I think just last week, um, to see who our next AmeriCorps volunteer may be, but just want to really um, give a shout out to Ashton. Um, and I can add to that, we Please. officially had someone accept our position oh, yesterday, and they are planned to be here around August 26th to start on the job September 1. So we were able to fill it one more year. Excellent. That's amazing news. Um, and I, I was going to talk about this. This goes in so many different categories. Um, it could be under the stewardship category, of course, but 
big shout out to Deb and the rest of the staff. We had our first 50th um, birthday party, if you will, for celebrating the Wasson Valley Restoration Project that was held up at Spruce Ranch. That was in May. And it took so much planning that started well before I took this position. And Deborah did an amazing job of really pulling it all together and as well as the staff. And it was a great event. Um, we had a great turnout. We had um, no, some officials from NOAA um, come visit for the events and as well as members from the Coquel tribe and the Confederated tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayusla Indians. And it was just a beautiful day. So just wanted to, again, just reiterate, all, there's so much hard work um, that goes into it. I was joking that Alice was the bride and we were putting pulling off a wedding. Um, I think it, it turned out okay. <laughs> I think um, unless anyone has any questions, I'll turn it over to Sabra. Uh, this is uh, Sabra Comet. I'm the uh, Coastal Training Program lead. <clears throat> so I'm going to um, report out on a joint venture between me and um, Jamie Bellinger, uh, education lead, uh, of the uh, pre-market assessment, uh, or sorry, market analysis needs assessment, or MANA. I always get those two A's mixed up. Uh, so this was something that um, has been a long time coming. There have been sector-specific or program-specific MANAs done in the past, uh, much smaller scale, um, although they've all been, um, again, very specific to program or to sector, uh, we haven't had a comprehensive one to the reserve in quite a while. I couldn't find an exact date. Um, but with uh, the big benefit of Amana is figuring out um, scope, reach, niche, um, gaps, strengths, and weaknesses. So it's, it's quite a comprehensive effort if you try and do it at, um, for the whole reserve. Uh, so what we've um, found out really quick is um, it would be, and since we don't have an economist on staff, uh, it, we took advantage of a Neuroscience Collaborative um, capacity building funding opportunity to do a 12-month uh, basically pre-MANA or um, scoping effort. Uh, that was uh, just under $10,995 uh, uh, to be exact that we used to hire a consultant, uh, Sea and Shore Solutions LLC. Um, we did go through a you know bidding process, um, but thinking, uh, we we're really happy that they're the ones that ended up um, taking the bid. Uh, they were actually, um, uh, I actually, um, had reached out to them to ask them to bid because they had successfully um, done a similar-ish project um, for Coos Bay um, with the local planners work, uh, planners network. Um, so they knew the area. Uh, so basically the big questions for this scoping was what do we know, which we kind of were able to put together stuff, um, but also what do we not know, which again, we were able to do a little bit of that um, ourselves, but the big question was, what do we not know that we don't know, which takes an ex, um, it's really good if you can have an external partner come in you know, with a fresh set of eyes and start asking those questions. Um, so the um, Sea and Shore Solutions team came in and interviewed, um, reserve staff, mostly the program leads, uh, to um, kind of compile a really good uh, um, summary of what our current scope needs, audiences, uh, gaps, strengths, weaknesses, and uh, capacities are. Uh, then, um, again, working regularly with Jamie and I, uh, we asked them to then help us put together a plan for the bigger MANA effort. Um, so I didn't include this in your packets because again, that's kind of a pre-mana. I wasn't, um, I didn't think it would be too interesting until we have the full mana. But if you do want to look at the full report, it's about 15 pages and um, I do have a copy of it and can give you electronic copies later. Um, but uh, the first part of the report was that um, the summary of the interviews from the staff, uh, what our current reporting, uh, like 312 evaluations uh, cover, um, our current gaps. And then 
Um, they identified seven methods that could be used for the full MANA, the multi-year effort. And Jamie and I um, selected two that really did not overlap anything that we do currently. Those were a social network analysis and a census analysis. Um, of course, keeping the other seven in the background, but these are the two that we would definitely want to um, use. Uh, these included both what the methods are, as well as the a simple implementation plan, timeline, and proposed budget for each one, which is super uh, helpful um, for us trying to find funding for that next step. Um, we do have two possible funding sources uh, identified, although the timeline is a little bit different for each one, so we kind of have to wait until certain things fall into place to see which one of those might be viable. Um, but until we know which of those funding uh, sources we might be able to utilize. Um, we've also gotten the support of the longer MANA process from um, members of the NARE system, several other reserve staff, um, including uh, some of the on some of the reserves that are um, on in the onboarding or uh, the ones that were recently designated, um, in particular, as well as some other established reserves that would want to do this for themselves. Um, several NOAA OCM staff, as well as I had the chance to um, go to a conference uh, in which uh, NOAA, the NOAA Economist um, Education and Outreach team was there. I proposed it to them, and they are on board to join the team when we have uh, that um, funding and the timeline more solidified for the full MANA um, effort. So. Uh, we've successfully closed out the grant for this pre-scoping uh, project. Um, we have a really good plan forward. And so once that um, funding sources uh, are solidified, then we have, um, we'll provide an update and launch that process, which will probably be within the four to five year range. Uh, I know that was a lot of information at once, so if you have any questions, let me know. If you want a copy of the report, uh, let me know. Although, again, it might be a little dry because it's all in the future. <laughs> uh, and that's it. Thank you very much uh, for that. I um, was fascinated by it, and I would like to read the full report. Uh, I think there might be some gems in there to, to learn from. Um, okay, so Patricia, I think it's back to you for the science report, or no, where are we going yep, next? Science. Yep, science. Yep, um, so there is a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of information in your packet about various projects that are going on. I'm just going to highlight um, a, a few of them. So for a lot of our staff have been really busy with doing a lot of baseline monitoring, and this is related to the Wasson Valley Restoration Project. So um, once that area is restored, it was really important to make sure that we had really good baseline monitoring data across the board. That can be from deer scat collection um, uh, for DNA analysis to take, making sure that we have all of our stream temperature data loggers in there to get our um, our information um, downloaded, measuring tidal height, um, looking at groundwater wells, really just across the board, making sure that from um, <laughs> from below ground all the way up using our, our drone, that uh, which has been assisting with the monitoring data collection as well, we've got a really good baseline for that Wasson Valley um, pre-restoration project which not to delve too much into stewardship, but is kicking off today with the earth moving. Um, that's why Alice is not able to attend today. She's literally standing in the field, um, not far from us <laughs> in the Wasson Valley with the contractor right now. Um, but that's been a lot of exciting um, work. Additionally, a lot of work has been happening on the invasive five spine um, crab. So Sean had two interns um, from um, the Southwestern Oregon Community College looking at um, building an industry around green crabs and seeing if there is um, if there is a market basically to help keep this invasive species under control. So basically they've been looking at comparing relative abundance of the five spine crabs and native crabs in the estuary, um, better understanding the life cycle of these invasive crabs um, and looking at how we can basically try to um, limit further um, 
reproduction of it or some way because catching is not really working so great there isn't a commercial market for it right now like how can we reduce those populations it's got two new interns that um, just started in june and they're gonna look at the effects of green crabs on eelgrass seeds um, like laura had said but in general we've got right now 12 different interns um, working on a variety of different projects so it's not just the important work that these interns are doing or assisting with, but it's also their mentors. And so the mentors are the South SLU staff. I mean, these are the folks that are really taking these folks under the fold, helping them with their research project, keeping them engaged, and really setting the stage for future natural resource scientists and managers. So it's really important to recognize that, yes, our interns are amazing, but also so are the South SLU staff because they're the ones that are with them every day in the field, teaching them how to walk in waders and not get stuck in the mud and, you know, take a shower, take a hot shower once everything leaks and um, get up the next day. And maybe it might be at 4 a.m. to go out and do a survey. So um, it's just, it's, it's so much work. And it's my first time really seeing the season. And I've been really impressed with how well everything's been going, um, especially as other folks still life goes on, take vacations, and they just are always there to help each other out. Um, I would also like to just introduce too that our we have a new um, uh, Margaret Davidson graduate fellow that's going to be starting, and it's Lizzie, Lizzie Deal, and she'll actually be here at our next South SLU all staff meeting. Um, coming up in August. She's a graduate student at um, the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. Dr. Erin Galloway is her university advisor, and she will be studying food webs associated with the five spine green crabs using a novel lipid analysis in eDNA. She started at OIMB in April of 2024, and she's going to officially start her kickoff here at South SLU in August. So very excited to um, meet Lizzie, and we'll all hear more about her important work probably at the next um, Management Commission meeting. I think for highlights, um, there's a lot more in your packet, of course, about what's going on, but if no one has any questions, I'd like to do a couple highlights on the stewardship end as well. I just count <laughs> on my fingers the next management commission meeting is it's after November. November. Oh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> that's, what Mark, I, that's what I count. Okay. <laughs> I still use my fingers to count. <laughs> So for the stewardship front, again, Alice is um, standing in a field not far from us, um, but today is the official kickoff for a lot of the earth moving work. Um, really, we've been lately for the last oh, month or more, um, uh, we've had contractors come out helping to mow the area just so we can even see what the heck is going on. The area that is um, going to have a lot of earth moving work is filled with the invasive um, reed canary grass, bringing that down, doing some channel relocation um, and tipping of trees. There's so much involved with that restoration project, but today is a really big day and that's gonna be going on the heavy earth moving work for the next four weeks or so. Um, the trail system is closed right now while that work is being done. And we're, we're actually working with a contractor now um, so that after the restoration work is done, how we can restore public access and actually improve access to the area so that folks can really engage and see all of the amazing work once that work is completed. So we'll have more to share on that note a little bit um, in the future since this is gonna be a big multi-year project. Um, but Alice wanted to make sure again, all of that pre-restoration monitoring work, um, Jenny and other South Sioux staff and interns, big shout out to them, thank you. Uh, and again, the Wasson um, Valley 50th celebration um, was an amazing event. Um, the main restoration work, again, is to convert that reed canary grass back to wetlands. Um, the earth moving component should be complete by late August. And then next year, we'll be really be focused on wetland planning efforts. The schedule for forest thinning associated with this um, is the prep work will start in September. Main thinning in the area will actually occur in February of 2025. So again, this is a multi-year effort and we're really excited about future public access to really see all the work that was completed. Um, and we'll have more on that probably 
by maybe November, by the next commission meeting. Are there any questions about stewardship? No, okay. I think that does it for you, Patricia. Um, and we talked about the Lee property um, first thing. Um, so next we have the report from the Friends of South Slough. And you'll need a mic or you can come up here. Everybody? Um, Christine had a little emergency of her own. Uh -huh. and It's a day um, of emergencies, she, isn't it? She is currently on crutches, but healing. Uh-oh. So, um, and I guess she did a lot of damage to her wrist, so it's hard to hobble around with clutches, crutches when you can't hold on to things. So um, anyway, she's, um, she's going to see the doctor on Monday, but um, she says she's getting better, just in a lot of pain. So. Oh. Um, okay. uh, and she did submit a report. It's in your packet. She did. And Jeannie, could you identify yourself? For the oh, I'm sorry. I'm Jeannie Stanley with the Friends of South Slough. Um, and so just a few highlights. We, we got to thinking about the 50th celebration and the Friends of South Slough has been partnering with the reserve for 36 years. Um, we, uh, Christine, I, um, and I attended the Wasson celebration and Melody Caldera, who is the primary author on the South Slough Adventures book, um, was able to come. She was able to give some remarks. But one thing that she did that was really remarkable was on the books that we gave out to the dignitaries, she sat and she personally inscribed each one with a special personalized um, dedication to each one, which I thought was really awesome. Um, and so, yeah, the new South Slough Adventures 50th anniversary book is complete and it's available. I meant to bring some today, but somehow they walked out the door without them. Um, it's available at Books by the Bay, at the Shore Acres um, gift store, at the Coos Bay North Bend Visitor Center, and at the History Museum. So it's kind of cool, you know, uh, has, has um, a few new things in it. Mostly it's the same document, but Melody wrote a new um, forward, um, which was interesting to look, look back at how things have changed. And there's some new pictures and a timeline of some key events that have happened in the history of the reserve. Um, in addition to that, um, Bob Bailey wrote uh, his reflections on how South Slough became a reserve. And he approached the friends with that, and we agreed to publish it. And it's um, it's ready. It's ready to go to the publisher. So um, uh, we um, regret that we don't have a copy of that to share today, but we will have it for the land board meeting. Um, Bob will bring them down from the printer in August. So that will be coming up. We um, are looking at what the costs are and what the pricing would, of that would be, but we will be gifting some of those to the dignitaries. So keep in mind um, that. Also for the September event, um, the Z Club at the high school provided $500 so that we could hire some of their students. That is help. so cool. Yeah. I read that in the report. That's yeah. awesome. To help with that. And then um, uh, the friends have also provided a few letters of support this time. So that's it for now. Any questions? Any questions of the commission? Uh, we so appreciate FOSS being a partner with the South Slough. And um, I thought that was really great that the Z Club gets to participate. Um, that, that's so great for young people. It, it'll be fun to have the high school students there. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, okay, so our next scheduled meeting uh, uh, is November, and the reason I was counting on my fingers is because the one after that will be in March, and then the one after that is in July. So um, I, I announced my retirement. Um, it is scheduled for July 1, 
um, so of 2025. So I am only going to be at a commission meeting in November and March. I just realized that. So those are my last two commission meetings and I'm getting a little sad about that. Um, I have really enjoyed this work here. Um, and it's a hard decision to make to retire. And I know Jessica just did it and we can do it. Mike, you did it at one time. We all can do it. Uh, sometimes it takes a lot of courage to do it. Um, but um, I'm just giving you all a heads up. I've got two more meetings and we have a lot to do. Um, I have a lot to do before I complete my work at the department as well. And I have a tracker on my phone that tells me how many days I have left. Um, and I don't do the minutes and the hour because that's too much anxiety. But the purpose of it on my phone is that when I'm with my staff or anyone here, it's like I pull it up on my phone and I say, we have this many days to get it done um, because um, there are some legacy projects that I, I really want to tie up. And I just, I'm, you know, I'm still going to be around, but it's just, I'd like to take that leadership role and continue with it. So I do want to thank all of you for everything you do here at the South Slough, our interns, couldn't live here without you and it's an experience that you can talk about to your grandchildren you know in your later years it's just amazing work here and amazing science and education I just can't say enough about it and I really want to thank all of our commission members because it takes time out of your day to come here um, I know you'd rather be out in the forest doing something Lance but you know what, this is this is fun. Um, and we only meet four times a year. So um, I think it's it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, so uh, I, I will throw it out for any final comments before we close today. Anyone in the mission on, have any comments? I'd like to say I did go to the 50th anniversary and it was fabulous. Very well organized. The weather was perfect, you couldn't order better. Yeah, you know, the food was good, the all the presentations. It was really fun to hear um people get up and talk. It was it was really well done. So thank you very much. Yes, and that was Jessica and and she's right. We did order the weather that day and <laughs> and and we got we got a good deal on the weather. Um uh, anyone uh, any of the commission members have any parting comments before we take a motion to adjourn from the vice chair, Laura? Uh, just to comment on that, on the last celebration, um, <clears throat> I was very impressed with the way they handled a very difficult parking situation, um, and it went off so smoothly. I couldn't believe it. So uh, I just wanted to congratulate them on that. Yes, I had my doubts about that, and it worked out beautifully, except when I fell out of the van. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when we got back here, I didn't take the right step and I fell out of the van. But fortunately, there were two strong men standing there to catch me. So I, I did not end up on crutches. Uh, but yes, it was great. Um, yes, thank you, Sabra. Um, our IT person is on leave at the moment. So we appreciated Sabra's work. Um, Cinnamon or Chris, any comment? Nothing for me. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, Laura Beth, you're my vice chair. You're our vice chair. What, what do you say about a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Do I have a second? I'll second. And Jessica second that, and we know that's not debatable. So all of those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Opposed? You don't count, but uh, <laughs> I have to ask. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We are adjourned.